let's talk about embolism. Embolism usually and often implies a venous embolism to the lungs, but theoretically emboli or thromboemboli could be systemic through the arterial side of the circulation going away from the heart rather than towards and they don't have to be blood clots. They could be fat, they could be air, or they could be amniotic fluid. But let's talk about the common, uh, probably very close to number one killer in the U.S., pulmonary embolism. The reason why you'll never see it on uh, death uh, lists, mortality lists, is because it's not a disease in itself. It's usually secondary to extensive infection or extensive malignancy or extensive mobilization like we saw from anything. The vast majority of pulmonary emboli are silent. You don't feel them. When you do, the most common symptom is chest pain and a low PO2 or hypoxia, which would, is often accompanied by shortness of breath. If you have a sudden occlusion of more than 60% of your pulmonary vasculature, this represents a very high risk for sudden death or, and or acute core pulmonale or acute right heart failure. Uh, very often, if the acute occlusion is, let's say, significantly less than entire lung, let's say 25, 30, 15 percent, these are ones that are usually silent, uh, although they can be symptomatic. Uh, if you have a saddle embolism or an embolism, a thromboembolism which straddles the bifurcation between the right and left main pulmonary artery acutely, uh, as you would guess, that would be theoretically approximately a 100% uh, occlusion. Those are usually fatal and uh, often when you do an autopsy and you want to determine whether this uh, embolism formed before or after the patient died. And of course, if it formed after the patient died, that's very, very common. As you remember, when you had your cadavers, you'd seen tons and tons of blood clots, sometimes very hard, chiefly inside of veins. Uh, but if it formed before they die, that could even often is the reason why they died. So let me give you a couple tips and then I'll show you a couple pictures. If a blood clot is uh, friable, in other words, has some kind of crumbly texture and adherent to the wall and has little lines, both grossly and microscopically alternating blood cells with fibrin. These are the features of pre-mortem blood clots, clots that form before you die and perhaps may have even contributed to why you die. If the blood clot has no real texture and maybe layers out into a fatty layer or a jelly-like layer, or what they call current jelly and chicken fat, these are usually post-mortem clots. These are lines of zon, alternating cells with fibrin. Uh, here is a clot which adheres closely to the wall of a vessel, so you know that could not have formed after the patient died. And by the way, this is current jelly, real current jelly, and that's chicken fat. And that's exactly what the blood clots may look like, even if they're mixed in uh, after the patient dies. Here's a saddle embolism, and you can see this is the main bifurcation between the right and left pulmonary artery. You don't have to wonder why this patient was autopsied. Uh, a saddle embolism like this, straddling the saddle, straddling the saddle is uh, usually fatal. Uh, systemic emboli are regarded as arterial emboli. Most of them are from the heart, but about 20% are from the aorta. And uh, like we said before, the chance that they lodge downstream is pretty much directly proportional to the amount of flow uh, related to the diameter of the artery uh, that the organ uh, gets. Uh, let's talk about non-blood clot emboli. Fat emboli can occur and usually in regard to extensive trauma uh, regarding long bone fractures where there's a lot of fat. Air emboli are classically described in uh, a scuba diver who ascends too rapidly and due to the fact that uh, nitrogen uh, does not uh, dissolve as easily as oxygen, uh, we can get some bubbles, a lot of them, 
that can cause an embolism. Some of them could be quite severe, symptomatics, infarctions. Um, you might have seen some movies where somebody uh, takes a 5 or a 10 cc syringe and pokes it into a patient's vein and kills him. Well, you know that that's baloney because it takes a lot more than 5 or 10 cc's of air to kill a person. Uh, I can guarantee you, although I don't want to do the experiment, I could shoot 10 cc's into your veins right now. You'd never feel it. And, of course, with a lot of very prolonged or difficult deliveries, we can have amniotic fluid emboli, which also has a very, very high mortality rate as well. Let's take a look at this little thing here. It looks like marrow. It looks like there's a lot of fat in the marrow. And as you know, marrow is normally 50% fat. So you say, okay, well, why is Dr. Menarsic showing me this normal bone marrow? Well, the reason why I'm showing you is because it's inside of a blood vessel. So you know that's a fatty embolism. And it was probably caused by a fracture of a bone in which there was a hematopoietic marrow present as well as fat. Technically, the shafts of long bones are only fat, aren't they? Let's introduce the next concept of clogged blood vessels, uh, especially arteries, and we're going to talk about infarction. Infarction is defined as an area of necrosis in tissue or organs which is secondary to significantly decreased blood flow. If the organ or tissue has a lot of collateral circulation, like the lung or the liver, this infarction can look quite hemorrhagic. If it has end arteries, like perhaps heart, kidney, spleen, we talk about anemic infarcts because there is no secondary blood around it. They look pale, at least in the acute phase. Of course, with time, they can turn white because we would think that there would be fibrosis occurring uh, as uh, time went on from the weeks to the months. So if you see fibrosis as the primary uh, process in an infarct, you know that that's not recent, do you? You know it's at least months and possibly years old. And uh, red infarcts are basically in arteries uh, that uh, have collateral, and white infarcts are in end arteries. And like we uh, talked about with blood clots, you have a progression of tissue changes described extensively in Chapter 2 from acute to organizing to fibrosis. Acute being hours to days, organizing being days to weeks, fibrosis being weeks to months to years. So we're talking about many acute infarcts uh, being their characteristic appearance, red or white. As time goes on and there's an ingrowth of blood vessels, macrophages, uh, early fibroblasts, they can look kind of yellow. And then with time, that yellow is replaced by a denser fibrotic scar. Let's talk about infarction factors. Well, first of all, nature of the vascular supply is very important. The better it is, the less likely it is to infarct. Uh, if a infarct occurs very, very slowly, it generally has a better prognosis because the adaptive mechanisms have kicked in. If it occurs very, very rapidly, you're more likely to get acute necrosis and death of tissues or organs. Certain t cells and tissues are very, very vulnerable to hypoxia because uh, cardiac muscle cells are uh, very oxygen thirsty. They are more vulnerable to a sudden decrease in oxygen than a fibroblast, which is not quite as oxygen thirsty. And of course, if you have congestive heart failure and poor uh, flow in general, that that would be a uh, factor in infarction as well. CHF patients that have infarcts, as you would guess, don't do as well as the uh, control groups. Here's an infarct of the lung. It's almost always at the peripheral of the lobes. You palpate along the uh, pleural edges. It's hemorrhagic because the lung has a dual blood supply. Here's an infarct of the spleen, and uh, it is not hemorrhagic. It's solid. It's anemic. It might even be organizing because it looks a little bit yellow, but the technical name for this is an anemic or white infarct, and that's because 
It's not hemorrhagic because the spleen, like the kidney, has end arteries rather than a secondary circulation like you have out here in the lung. That's it for now, folks. Thank you very much.